Hey guys, Steve with Podium One. I'm here with Chandler. Uh, we got word of uh, a video here from Jimmy Broadbent. We love Jimmy. We actually just wanted to watch this video, do a quick response to his reaction of one of our builds, and get a chance to ask, or excuse me, answer some of the questions that we get asked all the time and give some clarification around some of them. Now, did you guys know Joe Rogan is into sim racing? It's entirely possible. He's a degenerate like us. <laughs> I'll admit that just I like us. Didn't know that, but you guys sent me like 50,000 messages saying, like, Amazing. have you seen Joe Rogan's sim rig? So I thought it would be a good idea to check out Joe Rogan's sim rig build, maybe talk about some of the bits that I like, some of the bits I dislike, and whether it's worth that massive $70,000 price tag. <laughs> <laughs> no, what the <laughs> Quickly, if you're new to the channel, you don't know who I am. My name is Jimmy. I've been a sim Love racer Jimmy. for... Go. Too long. <laughs> Way and too I also co-own a business called a Brit Sim, I didn't know which this. is a sim racing hardware this is actually kind of cool. reseller. Hmm. So he yeah, understands sort of reselling and I know what is wholesale kind of pricing and shipping and everything that goes function. on with it. So I'm quite interested to see what happens when you build a sim rig with uh, no budget in mind. Let's go. There's always a budget. Oh, sweet. Yeah. First impressions, triple monitor, motion rig. <laughs> I love Jimmy. That's pretty badass. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I didn't know it was one thing. I'm going to be a massive nerd to pick up on this now and probably get back to it later on. That with the motion, it's not connected to the monitors. Mm -hmm. It's rig only. And I'll get into that a little bit later. If you guys are new here, we are Podium One Racing and we are the world's Very. best turnkey sim builders. And this is just another one in the process. Now, you guys haven't seen some of the sims we've built. I can't say I've heard of these guys before. Uh, that's not and a bad Jimmy. thing, though. Uh, sorry to do the guy dirty by um, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> But there are quite a few companies out there nowadays who. Good news is, real quick, Jimmy, we know who you are. Before we even started Podium One, I used to watch you all the time when I was doing my uh, sim racing journey and getting learning all the different things that go into all of this. So. Say, right, give us X amount of money and we'll bring an awesome sim rig to your house, which is a very cool idea, but I do think you end up paying a uh, bit over the odds for that. Let's let him explain the rig though before we start jumping into any of those conclusions. So the P1 Ultimate is the top of the line system that we have here at Podium One Racing and this is the Ultimate with the Obsessed Garage option on it and we're actually adding on a few extra details that are going to be unique really to Joe Sim specifically. As you guys can see where it's at right now is a lot of the wiring is done. We have the pet. First things first let's talk about the rig itself, the actual base, those little metal bars you see there. That is, looks to be 80-20 which is what actually what my Sim rig here is made out of although maybe not quite as Nicely finished. finished. <laughs> <laughs> you need cash. Hey, mine's like that at home too. The profile to do this and probably build your own sturdy frame for about 300 to 400 pounds if you look in the right places. The frame itself isn't really anything special, but it doesn't really need to be. In fact, I'd even argue that having this sort of rig can be a little bit too hardcore for the normal user. What I'm getting at is that is definitely the standard for like a nice sturdy rig, which is super. Yeah, so where he's getting with this and what I just want to touch base on, and you can add on Chandler, but it, it is super important. So we've tried various different chassis. This is one that we actually um, make with ASR. Um, but 80-20, as much as it's kind of like what you see out there, and to a degree kind of ugly, it's just so modulated, so modular, I should say, right? You can add so many things to it today, tomorrow, five years from now type of thing. Because the reality is whether you're buying a $2,000 sim rig a $50,000 sim rig or beyond, <clears throat> you want something that you can continue to build on, to adapt with, to change your different styles. Yep. And what we find with some of the others that are out there is you just end up getting a little too limited as far as when you want to start adding on a lot more peripherals. Well, even us, we've tried to uh, propose the idea of moving pa past an 80-20 rig, but you Multiple can't because buttons. it's just so practical. It's just so practical, yeah. right? And it's like so many other things. Like sim, how like a sim racing. Sometimes I hate to say this, but it's like gun ownership. When you find people buy a gun, they start adding on all these add-ons, right? So you start yeah. with this the handgun itself, and then the next thing you know, you're getting uh, flashlights, you're getting different optics, you're doing you know all these different mods that kind of go on to things, um, and you want to be able to have that room. So anyway, that's where he's getting with this. In addition to that, they're super sturdy. Yep. The way that they're which, built, which is needed. <laughs> so I wanted to add. Remember my first rig? Yeah. The um. It was like a GTR racing rig. Yeah. So it was essentially like a, a cheap gaming seat on a on a metal rail with a, a metal single metal rod going on, and I had a, a Semi Cube uh, Two Pro or Pro yeah, Two. Yeah, you had a Pro, yeah. And because that the thing, thing had twenty five new meters, the whole <laughs> thing is flexing. So while I'm turning, going through, you know, say you know, turn eleven, turn twelve at uh, at Road Atlanta, 
the whole thing, I'm losing fidelity because it's it can't support the Newton meters that I could put out. So that's why it's important to have yeah. that. So and, and then again, you get we get into it later, and Jimmy talks about it as yep. well with braking yep. and such. Pretty important, especially when you have things like direct drive wheels mounted to them. And one of the yeah, unique aspects that we yep. did for Joe was we painted it in a actual Porsche chalk gray. He didn't specifically want any particular custom color. And that's pretty but cool. Here we like to have a little bit of that custom finish on. But I am gonna here say. Which is it? Is it this bit that's painted with chalk grey, or the the profile? Because the profile, <laughs> yeah, this is a Porsche chalk grey. It's chalk crazy, gray, right? I've yeah. got, got the Porsche chalk grey right here. To be fair, I think they have actually painted bits of it that colour, but it doesn't really stand out that much, does it? It just sort of blends in with the rest of it. That's right. So here, especially with this lighting, our office is kind of dark, or our, our warehouse is kind of dark, even though we have some lighting over there over all the supercars and stuff that we work on. Um, there's a lot of lights that are off and it's dark. So when you look at this, looking at this video, it absolutely does look more of a gray, but it is absolutely a chalk gray painted to match the Porsche. And when it's one-to-one, -one, when you're right next to it, it looks exactly like it. And to a lot of people, who cares? Yeah, right. right? But to Porsche chalk gray people, it is a very special color. Well, and the, the main reason that I think we wanted to go with a color like that is one that's neutral because it, Joe didn't want anything that was too crazy. Yeah. Like he didn't he didn't care to have it colored, but he didn't want like you know a bright red or a blue or something that you know like some of the other ones we do. Like yeah, you guys exactly. will see Harry will put in some stuff, but we have like we'll do Miami blue, we'll do lava orange, we will do racing yellow, candy whatever, purple, right? for candy Roman purple Atwood. with Roman, yep. whole bunch of different colors. Well, but with that carbon seat, all of our systems standard are black. We wanted to be able to show off the pieces that we're going to show off, and so we you know Joe's a huge contrast. Porsche guy, so have some contrast. I think it, it turned out, but. I do agree that it does look kind right of like here. On <laughs> it looks like a yeah, yeah. standard. Maybe I should paint this mint after my uh, crazy MX-5. Yes. But with some of the touches that we wanted to add on, we wanted to make it unique because it's obviously Joe Rogan. One of those big things is going to be the seat. Now we're going to take you guys to the back and show you guys a little bit of information on that seat before we go ahead and add it on and install it onto the seat. So I'm really interested to see what seat they've got for this. So for me, the two big important things in the sim rig um, and you might think, oh, wheel pedals. Is... No, it's not. It's the rig itself keeping something sturdy and your seat. Something your that's comfy and supports your, your back, back is push. very yeah. important, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of laps. Driving is not a natural position to be in. You end up being like a fucking Ooh. hermit like this guy after all this time. But I am going to go ahead and guess they haven't used my Swamp Pass Edition <laughs> OMP TRSE. This writing is actually starting to go brown. I really need to replace this. Seat. We'll help you. How? Yeah, this okay, is nice. An actual race car seat from Recaro. This is the Recaro podium seat right here, as you can tell. That's an expensive seat. Yes, I've got is. the um, homologation stickers on, so you can use this in a real race car if, yep. you, if you want to, which is pretty mad and pretty overkill. That's right. It, it does is, look but sweet, look at it. You know, yep. Like you just said, it looks sick as shit. Looks actually deceptively comfy it, to it, me. Hold on. I want to pause on that. I'm uh, right now, what, 245 pounds, I'm 6'2". Um, that chair is actually gives me more room than the Pro Sim Star. Which is Recaro Sim Racing the Seat. The other Recaro Sim Racing Seat, which is yeah. also based off their pole position. The way the bolstering set up on it, it actually flares out, and so for my fat ass, I can actually fit in it a lot easier. And then the padding itself is really dense, and you can spend a lot of time in it. There's not a single time where I've gotten in that chair and thought, oh, this is getting uncomfortable. Well, what's cool is on Recaro's site, they even say you have they have different, uh, uh, I guess, density uh, pads that Pad, you can yeah. swap out yeah. on that seat. So. Yeah. And if you have a little bit of money to spend on a nice seat, then I feel like you fall into a trap of going with something nice and racy and carbon fibery. And I've done that before. I've had a carbon fiber tillet seat on my old Praga rig. And it looked great, but after like an hour in the rig, you start feeling a bit uncomfy. It's not really much room for you to breathe in there. But I really recommend, and I know it's not the most premium thing, it's just go to your like local junkyard and pick up like a secondhand Absolutely. car seat. You don't need to have it a bucket seat in sim racing, unless you have a motion rig, which it seems that Joe does, so maybe he does need one. But for the, for the normal person, you don't need a bucket seat. There's gonna be several dozen peripherals installed on this rig meaning that USB cables have to be powered properly, whether it's USB 3.0, right. 2.0, uh, data cables mm -hmm. for the motion Perfect. actuators. Yeah. For us, it's like a giant puzzle of putting it together in the most perfect way. So we've got probably 15 to 20 hours in wiring <clears throat> just on the chassis. 15 to 20 hours of wiring? Maybe this is what I'm doing wrong. What I do is I just, I, <laughs> I, actually, I'm not even gonna show you what it looks like. My cable management, well, there is none. 
but this thing has to be able to... So, we'll probably get into more of this, but while we're looking at this, I want to touch on certain things, right? So, you go to my rig at my house, it's a bird nest, right? And mm -hmm. there's been times where, before we started Podium, where I'm like, oh, I'm going to redo this, and we get the, uh, the little, uh, whatever they're called, plastic little things that go in, right? They yep. help cable management and stuff, and you get the... The, the power brake mounts and all the different types of stuff. Zip ties and Right, all the zip ties and shit. But the reality is, and for a lot of people watching this and who flame us for all this different shit all the time, the reality is, is that for your own home built rig that you've built, you will cut corners or you'll take shortcuts or you'll live with certain things because you just want to get racing. And after a while, you don't see it. But realize from us, from a business perspective, it's a finished good. It's a product that someone is getting that they've paid money for, which we'll get into the bits and pieces of that here in a minute. But it is a finished product that when someone gets it, they don't want to just put it into a corner and make it look like a mess, right? By the time our sims are done, you literally have two plugs that you just plug into the wall and that's it. We have all the power management, all the surge protectors, all the USBs, everything's already done to make it where it's so simple. And, and well, not only that, it's, <clears throat> it's making sure that everything is adequately powered, which seems like, okay, that's, you know, of course, <laughs> but like, think about how finicky D-Box is with power requirements. <laughs> Think how finicky wheelbases are with USB power requirements or just data transfer. And the screens, right? With GSI. And so for us, it's being able to not only wire it perfectly, but then also make sure that the customer, if they ever have to service it, can easily get in there. It's accessible. And, or, or even just upgrades. Not yeah. even servicing, but just if they have to upgrade or they wanted a, a higher end wheelbase or a new wheelbase or a new flight stick or whatever it is, that they can easily add it to the rig and it'd be a, a simple process for them rather than if you had just a giant entanglement of wires everywhere and you gotta fish it and take it apart. Yeah, and these people don't even know what they're doing. They don't want to. Right. That's why they, Every, that's yeah. where they come to us, right? Yep. And then it comes with the turnkey aspect. But everything's labeled, everything's accessible where they can quickly unplug and do things should they need to troubleshoot anything or to your point, change Support it up. up to a thousand pounds, moving, vibrations, there's a lot of things going on. People putting, you know, 100 kilograms of pressure on a brake pedal. So that means that every nut and bolt has to be so tight to a point where someone could have this rig for two years and, and race on it, you know, 10 hours a week and nothing moves unless it's supposed to. Guys, like I agree with that. Your rig does need to be sturdy, but I put this rig together myself mm. and it's been together six years. I don't think that's a reason to charge someone 50 grand. Well, we don't charge 50 I grand I feel really that, cynical in this that. video so far. I'm like, nah, you shouldn't do that. Nah, you shouldn't do that. I think my cynicism comes from, I've been exposed to a lot of what I like to call collector sim rigs. Big brands will basically put out their own version of a sim rig. There's like an Aston Martin one that came out that was like the best part of yeah, a quarter of a million screen. pounds. Yeah. And it's just, you know, a normal wheel with a nice Right. Shell. And you know, there are people and that want to. The whole idea for sim racing for me is, is uh, that we, we sim race because we can't go real racing because it's very expensive and sim racing shouldn't be at the point where it costs the same as a race car. And so I want to touch on that as well. And I'm sorry, we're going to stop quite a bit and the video will turn long, but it's important, right? So there's a few things. One, we sell all the individual items and we'll go over some of the pricing and stuff, but we sell all the individual items on our website. So people can go and buy a wheel, you know, if it's a GSI wheel for 1600 bucks or 1700 bucks, it's the same price on our website that you can do that. <clears throat> um, or you can go ahead and get turnkey stuff. Now realize that there are people who only want to spend $5,000 and that's totally fine, right? right? And again, we help all those people all the time, um, more so than, than a $60,000, a $70,000 rig. However, again, for, for the rigs like this, um, you gonna say something? I'm sorry. No, no, I kind of lost my train of thought, but the, the point is... is um, well, you had a really good analogy. Uh, you said it a, a couple times last year that, uh, let's take Audi, for example. They sell a wide range of products, but yeah. their flagship would be, I wouldn't say their flagship, but uh, their uh, halo car, as they would call it, is their Audi R8, right? So imagine looking at the suite of Audi products, taking their R8 and saying, who can afford a $200,000 to $250,000 car? Well, it's like, okay, well, they do have a $225,000 car that's the most capable, the fastest, the nicest, whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they also sell, you know, an S3 or an RS3 right. or, or an A4 that's still a great car um, and it's still luxurious and whatever, but it fits the bill. So we sell products from, you know, a twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 complete turnkey sim delivered to your door all the way up to a... 70,000. Audi R8. Right. And, yeah. we'll, and again, we'll get into more of these details, but kind of where I was going with it as well is like, we have a lot of our customers who have various supercars and track cars, and they want something that 
resembles that as closely as possible. Mm. And as much as we love like the Moza R9, we've sold plenty of them, or the La Prima from Acetec, or whatever, right? Sim Magic, all the different things that are out there. The reality is, is that those people are looking for something that matches what they're used to when they're actually driving on track. That's right. Right? As close as possible. We've had customers, for example, you guys, I don't know if you've seen that Porsche wheel. It's an $11,000 sim racing wheel from Porsche themselves. We've had customers say, I want that wheel because it's what's on my cup car and I want to match that identically, right? Yep. And so- And it's not close to, it's <clears throat> they want the exact. They want the exact. Now, so you do not, you know, like our first rig that we sold, or not the first one that we sold, but the first rigs in the beginning that we were selling were $9,000, right? Harrison Neville has one of ours. We delivered it from Nashville to Atlanta and installed it with a semi-cube motor, with triple screens, with all the stuff for $9,000, right? So you don't need a 25,000, a 35,000, a $50,000 rig. What happened is, um, maybe we'll put in a clip or whatever, but like Matt from Obsessed Garage reached out, wanted a sim rig and said, I want something that's gonna be crazy. It's never been done. That's never been done, at least by us and, or and, that and you've seen. And for quick context, the reason that he wanted something that's never been done that was crazy is because he has an Airbnb rental in the mountains in Georgia that his audience can rent out. And he wanted it to be, if they're renting out the destination OG, what they call it, the Obsessed yeah. Garage House. In Helen. They wanted a sim rig worthy of a sim rig, worthy of someone wanting to go and spend that much money for a house. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like to be a real experience. So he wanted this over the top thing. And he's like, what can we do? And we're just like, well, we've always wanted to kind of do these rigs with these arcs, but they're super expensive. And then you need right. the horsepower to run them and all the other stuff. And he's like, ultimately, he's like, let's do it, right? And so we went and created that. Then we started showing it, like, look at this thing. And that was like by far one of the most expensive things we'd ever done. And <laughs> by then, a long shot. And, oh, look at the fucking... Oh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, there was a crow that just flew by our window. Um, and then I, uh, everyone started reaching out saying, I want that Helen House rig. I want that Helen House rig. I want this. And I was like, wow, awesome. And that's even happened with this Joe rig, right? At $70,000. And I know, again, I keep saying, we're going to get more into the details of that. Uh, but we've had customer, multiple customers now say, I want that rig, but what else can you do? Yep. Right? And so it's like, okay, well, D-Box, for example, you have the inch and a half actuators with the Gen 5 for $8,000. We actually now have a six uh, inch actuator system that D-Box sells for $36,000. No, we don't make the pricing on that. We don't make the pricing on it. We're not making $36,000. And in fact, it. we couldn't sell it cheaper if we wanted to. No, we can't because <laughs> we have to abide by MAP pricing and MSR pri uh, yeah. MSRP with, with D-Box contractually. But like there are different levels and to some people it makes no sense. To others, it makes tons of sense, right? I won't get too much into it, but like Chandler and I had other businesses before this. We've been able to do, this came out of passion. We can get make a video about that as well, who we are, how we started this more. But my point is there is that, you know, I have an Audi R8 performance and my brakes just had to get redone on it and they're carbon ceramics. It was $37,000, right? To a lot of people, that's insane. But again, there's just different levels of different things for everybody. When I started sim racing, I had a uh, Next Level Racing FGT, I think it is, right? With a, a Logitech G923 with a single screen on an Xbox. And yep. that's what I started with, yep. right? So, and then it just kind of grew. My rig now at my house is nothing compared to this. Now well, this is work, right? This is what we do. We don't get, even need to get well, a chance to Well, last it. thing I'll say is uh, <laughs> we have a, a client in Colorado that races radicals and his cost for the season was almost 400 grand. Yeah. And so to him, investing in a high quality rig that, you know, he ordered a $35,000 rig, $40,000 rig, to him, it's pure, it's pure function. The form is, it looks nice, whatever, he, he, he likes how we do things, but to him it's like, I trust that this is a rig that will at least get me an 85% experience of what I can feel in the car so I can learn track so that I can do my investment well of 400 grand. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, again, because like the, the reason why the R8 had the brakes is we track it, right? We have different cars that we track, but the reality is what people don't understand, even with the MX-5, right? Because we have part of the team bought an MX-5 and we are tracking that. The car is just the entry. Yeah. Right. The car is just the entry. That's the, Jimmy. You know this, right? I'm sorry. We're we're not really engaging you on these conversations, but Jimmy, you know this. Tires. I mean, on some tires, we can spend four thousand dollars in a half a day of tracking. Yep. For one set of tires, right? You've got brakes. You've got uh, high temp brake fluid. You've got car maintenance. You've got track fees, insurance if you want it. When you're driving four hundred thousand dollar cars, it, sometimes it's good to have track insurance. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's all these things that add up. Then if you actually have a cup car or a track car, a real one, it's not street legal, which means now you need a truck, you need a trailer, you need to be able to haul this, you need the time that it takes, because for a lot of us, a lot of guys watching this, there's not a track an hour from your house. Yeah. 
right? Well, you look at, just to add to, you know, the truck, the trailer, whatever, not street legal, most of your race cars that are not street legal have a required engine or transmission rebuild at 60 or 80 hours. Yeah. Meaning that you've got another ten to twenty thousand dollars in expenses to overhaul. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah, just it's so, it, it, so and, expensive. And Jimmy said this, right? Yeah. Racing is expensive. He says this here, like I think in a second, how expensive racing is. And so, just keep all that in mind. That again, there's different levels of things. Mm -hmm. And if you want a ten thousand dollar rig, you know, you maybe maybe you have a car that costs a little more that you don't want to beat the hell out of all the time on the track. Um, but and track also has seasons, right? You're not always on track. As much as we love tracking, we were just at the track last week with radicals and other supercars and stuff. But we can't do that all the time. Today well, we're in California honestly, installing rigs. Honestly, more and more, it seems pretty rare. <laughs> with That's right. We, we don't get to do stuff. it any more yeah. nearly as much as we did before we started Podium. To get into things like ergonomics, right? Where should a shifter be? Where should an e-brake be? Where should a steering wheel be? How should it be positioned? Those are things that we have to think through. But when you start to get into <laughs> a system that can be used for actual training, there's a lot of stuff that we have to think through in the back end. I do agree with that. When we set up the Praga rig um, for training, it was very different from the rig that we used here. Just like this is like a content rig. The one I jump in and just mess around and have fun with. It's not set up to be the most realistic. With the Praga rig, we took measurements of the car. We got the mm. brake force. We got the throttle force all done properly. And that's the reason why we use that carbon fiber seat I mentioned earlier on. Sort of sit down with it and to give the proper driving position just how it was in real life and i have to say that there was a value there absolutely to that. is racing they're going to be doing but for joe's he's got a 993 gunther works porsche we know he's a porsche fan so we've got an officially licensed porsche rsr replica wheel this is pretty cool i've seen a few of these around before i'm i'm, I'm a big sucker for well in general <laughs> but for <laughs> motorsport style wheels i always like the closest you can get to a wheel looking like it belongs in the real life racing car for me is it's the, so the cooler it is. It's the same with this, um, got this Moza FSR wheel here. Basically the same thing. Moza FSR. It's like a real racing wheel. wheel. And I think for Moses immersion, Moses. actually yeah. physically trying to place yourself in this you know, pretend cockpit and pretend you're there driving as you do in sim racing, then that sort of thing is really Important. Real quick, so uh, price-wise, right? So realize that we just showed that F, um, the RSR wheel. So that's like a twenty-three hundred dollar wheel. Plus, you need the quick release. Quick Another release hundred fifty bucks. <clears throat> right, right. So there's that. But also realize, so one, that's a badass wheel, and that FSR, like I mentioned a minute ago, we used to sell a lot of Moses stuff. That FSR, and for six hundred fifty dollars, a wheel with a screen, right? It's not the best screen, but a wheel with a screen and carbon fiber and shit. That thing was awesome. Right for that price, because at right. that time most wheels with screens were like fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars minimum type of thing, right? Yep. So when that came out, I was like, "Wow, that's awesome." But something else to note here, because we're only looking at one wheel, and people are like, "Oh, you guys charge all this stuff." Like you can go to our website and see that wheel for the twenty three hundred dollars or twenty two, whatever it is, right? Which again, we don't set the pricing on that. No, it's what <laughs> Grid has it and stuff, right? And we got to import it and do all these different things. But also realize that this has a GSI Hyper P one. Yep. Which with four uh, with the four carbon paddles, so that's seventeen hundred dollars. We sell it for sixteen ninety nine. I think GSI has it for seventeen hundred. Um, it has a Max a GT Max thirty two, right? With the four paddles, carbon so fiber. Fifteen hundred dollar wheel. Uh, yeah, sixteen twenty two. I think something like that. Then we have a uh, the button box from four, the Acetec Forte button box with the round rim. So it has a fully round wheel. And then we also have what the Forte. Yep. The Forte uh, formula style uh, thing on there, right? So. There's five wheels right there. I think it was like $7,000 roughly in wheels. That's all on this. That you guys aren't maybe not realizing and noticing and people throw out different prices. Oh, it's a $1,200 wheel. It's like, dude, go look at the website right now for GSI directly. The Hyper P1 is $1,700. We sell it for $1,699. Yep. I mean, yep. it, yeah. So the pedal set that we have here, we've got two static pedals for the throttle and clutch. These are the Husingfeld Ultimates, company out of Germany. They make by far the best no. pedals. Well, another one. Yeah, company out of the Netherlands. Yeah. Nice yeah. Okay, so Jimmy says it. It can move it, by so. itself. Now, why would you want it to move by itself? All the subtle nuances, for instance. You guys, real quick, right? We're not perfect. Chandler's not perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'm not perfect. We you well, you got to understand, when we film these things, There's normally so I'm in the middle of, you know, a million emails, right? We're we got a lot going on. We got, we got phone on. calls. We got 20 employees. We're talking to people all over the world all the time doing different stuff, and we're yeah. going to make mistakes. So forgive us on that. There's another one in this video that I, I think I catch as well from you. Driving a car like a GT4 or a Porsche with ABS, you can feel the ABS. Now, I, I've not actually ever driven with a haptic pedal before. You should. But what he's saying here it. is completely correct. I've raced in real life in a whole host of different cars, cars with and without 
ABS. For have. example, in a downforce car Not racing, um, with no ABS, you have to stamp the brake as hard as you can, then gently peel off to avoid the brake locking, locking up. up. Whereas in a GE3 car or a GE4 car, you can That's just smash it, yeah. that brake pedal all you like. You'll go into the ABS, but you'll feel the ABS activating in your foot. Now, I've been told it's the exact same experience That's on right. one of these pedals, which would be very, very helpful. Super. Is it essential? No. no. Is it cool? Yeah. So this is something that we say all the time. People ask, like, these active pedals. I'm like, look, dude, if you're a 25-year-old kid and um, or a younger person and you haven't spent a lot of track time and you haven't been in these cars, I don't have an active pedal at home. You don't need it, right? That's you right. don't need it. However, every time we have a person who's a track guy or a pro, because we deal with a lot of, like, IMSA drivers, LMP drivers, and indie car drivers, and they feel that pedal, we don't even tell them that that pedal is there. People, are, what is this pedal? Yep. <clears throat> Because it's amazing how good it feels. And it's not just the ABS. Like, Jimmy, again, you'll know this. When you're in turns and you're trail braking, you feel that trail braking. You feel that grind or that, that brake binding or pulsing, whatever it yeah. is. Like more than, It's not just ABS, but you feel that brake applying to something physical, right? And these, that pedal replicates that so well. And then to mention just at the click of a button or a slider, you can change it from you know, five millimeters of travel all the way to like there's tons of travel. You can make it where it's 30 kilos of pressure or 100, 100 whatever it is that goes up to of pressure, all from sliders, as opposed to having to change out elastomers and doing all these different types of things with springs and such. Which is super relevant because say that I get an MX-5 in iRacing and then I get into the Corvette C8 GTE, which is one of my favorite cars in iRacing, and then we get an F1 car. It's all different. Yeah, but if you had a static brake pedal, now while it's weird how the brain adapts because the, the brakes do feel different virtually yeah, in those cars. That's right. Physically, it's the same exact brake pedal, which is not realistic at all. And so with this, you can at least have those profiles right. where I can mimic an MX-5 brake, I can mimic a GTE, that's right. et cetera. Like Daniel Morad and other drivers, they have their own profiles. So if you want to feel like what it is to be in a GT3 uh, AMG car like Daniel or a GT4, you can get that profile and instantly push a button and he has it what it feels like for him. Right? right there's f1 drivers that have done it for them i don't know what it's like in an f1 car i've never driven one Same. right so i'm going to rely on the people that have to say this is what it feels like and then you can do that with that pedal so that pedal's dope it's awesome there are <coughs> three samsung odyssey arc 4k 55 inch screens going Christ. on this setup you guys don't know <laughs> yes. how massive those are. dude in our first building it took up so much space you guys have no idea. In our first building, it was so tiny that that thing took up like half ten, of the ten foot wide, yeah, about seven foot deep. <laughs> I'm sorry, but every time they say this, I just look at my own sim rig. Yeah, <laughs> it is funny. It's the same. I, know, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I wonder how much they spent on the paint there. Too much. Yeah. But to be fair to these guys, I am looking at a video. I'm sure it looks different in person. Thank you. On the video, it, with it the lighting and stuff, it, it is You're very different. The PC, big boy. What do we that have is here? a big boy. Fully custom built PC with an NVIDIA RTX 4090. Mm. We've got DDR5 64 gigs of RAM. We're liquid cooled, and we've got an i9 13th gen. It's actually a 14th gen. That's pretty beefy. We it want is to have beefy. 20, 30 percent headroom in every PC, both from a processing standpoint, from a graphics standpoint, so that we can run the highest frame rates possible. The most that we can power is 120 hertz, and that's an NVIDIA lock. You can't go above 120 hertz for triple 4Ks. To be honest, you don't really need that. There's a lot of these crazy, like, high refresh rate right. monitors out there, and you don't really need to have this uber giga setup to do that. I still think that racing with 60 FPS is completely fine. You can, I mean, run 120 is a bit nicer, but beyond that, it doesn't make that too much of a difference. Correct. So, the other thing here that Jimmy and this, the audience in general needs to understand is first person shooters have been up forever. And for years, all we were ever trying to get is 60 frames per second because it's kind of what, that's what our eyes see, right? It's 60 FPS. And so the goal was to always get it to where you're at 60 FPS. I've been gaming forever and it's always been, you got to get 60 FPS. And then we all of a sudden get into sim racing and everybody's like, you got to be 120, you got to be 240, you got to have all this shit. It's like, you don't need that, right? <clears throat> now, you will see the trailing in a 60 uh, refresh rate versus the 120. There is mm -hmm. a difference. Yep. Is it like mind-blowingly different? No, but there is a difference, right? And when you're, when every inch counts in racing and when you're looking at apex and all the different things, obviously the faster it can refresh, the better. So to Jimmy's point, you don't need more. The big thing here that people need to understand is that when you're doing 4K monitors of this size, it, you can if you if you let the monitors go to their uh, 240 or their 160 these particular monitors 165 refresh rate only two of them will turn on 
that you cannot go over the 120. If you have to make it where they're all at 120 to make three of them turn on. Yep. You can always get two. If you unplug one, the other one will turn on. If you unplug or you plug them both in, one will turn off. And it's like whack-a-mole. It's all the time, right? <laughs> and so you got to understand that, um, why that is. Because some people were talking about that. It's like, oh, no, you can go higher. And it's like, no, on, on those particular screens, and we've tried it. We've talked to... Everyone's reached out to us now for for, oh, uh, and it's not like we've just tried it once. <coughs> no, I mean, we've built so many of these systems, and that... we've learned all the different things. In the beginning, with the uh, Gen One arcs, you had to it was HDMI only; those didn't have Display Ports. So then we had to get HDMI Display Port converters, and those even had to be the right type because we went through multiple different ones that just didn't work. The signal strength and stuff was just not good enough to where we found the right ones that worked. But now. Uh, with Joe's rig, Joe's were actually one of the first. They're the Gen, Gen 2 arcs yeah. that came out at the end of last year. But I do agree with having a 4090 in there. Have the resolution is going to be the killer on this. Having three 4K monitors is pretty ridiculous. Massive. So it's just the best course of action because the worst thing when you're sim racing is having an inconsistent frame rate because it messes up everything. everything. Messes up on your markers, messes up your braking, messes your concentration as well. So yeah, beefy card, but worth it, I think. Yep. And it's yeah. I didn't even know it was in this. <laughs> <coughs> Look how crazy wide that angle is. We're going to be able to give you guys a better representation cool, once dude. we get all the monitors on so you can Jimmy, see what's like powered up, visit. but this is You'll love it. I wanted to time lapse this part of the build because this is something you guys don't see all the tedious work that goes into the wiring. So here's a little bit of time lapse of that. So you guys have noticed, like, by the time this is done, there's no spider web. That seemed pretty quick. <laughs> well, sorry, I'm being such a dickhead in this no, video, yeah. man. It's I fine. feel like I'm really being normal. And you know this, stuff. Jimmy, from doing content. I've seen we can't so many sit there and of these, do. like, high-end rig builders who <laughs> use these words like attention to detail and build quality and all that. And that stuff exists outside of the 50 grand bracket, of you know. It's got to be something special if you're going to ask that amount of money. And again, we'll still get into some of the details, but realize we sell rigs for a fraction of this cost where we do the exact same thing. Thing, right all the cable management and all the stuff is in there all the uh, surge protectors and all the stuff that we've discussed before that's all there right shipping so, creating testing yeah and, and i want to get into that because as it gets go a little more because there's so much misunderstanding still with this about what goes on not just with all the products and the the cost of all of that but what happens beyond that um, but just understand that it's not like we're like oh we're going to do wire management we're going to charge you fifteen thousand dollars for that <laughs> it's just crazy so i'm i'm holding this to like the highest possible standard and i guess one other thing to say like i said earlier on when we started this we were looking at other companies that were out there charging people thirty thousand dollars for single screen rigs with no motion with belt drives crazy right and we were we'll sell rigs for twenty thousand dollars with triple screens with full d-box motion with uh direct drives and such um delivered to your door delivered to your door <laughs> yeah. right so and, and for those that, again, Jimmy, you, you have the store that you showed, you understand wholesale, you understand what it takes uh, to do that, the amount of money that you have to put out to get MOQs and all the different things so you can uh, actually do this and make money. You're making money just like Best Buy or Target or any other place that you guys go to. <clears throat> the money's made by us buying the product at such quantities from all the vendors, Assetex, Semi-Cube, ASR, Track Racer, GSI, whatever. The money's made because we're ordering so much in advance and we're bringing it all in that they sell it to us at a lesser price than what you, you buy it for. So again, if you look at our website, like I mentioned the RSR wheel for an example, it's $2,300 or the uh, FP, or the, um, the, the GSI wheels, right? $1,700. That's the same price you're seeing it on their website. But we're buying things at hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars at times, to where we're getting dis, uh, discounted pricing off that so we can sell it to you at the same price that you're seeing it everywhere else but that's where we're making money yes we're making money as well when we have to build out the rig but it's not thirty thousand dollars over msrp as everybody keeps saying that i mean that's just it's crazy the massive 55 inch samsung arc 4k curve monitors looking absolutely stunning we got all the lights set up we got the subwoofer back here all the wiring is tucked and ready to go and there's the so the many media, wires it is pretty there's intense. so many wires that people don't it understand. looks pretty crazy <laughs> i really like what i've done down here with the wheels <laughs> all four wheels that we have are not just powered here they're also synced with software so little, you can run everything about, about the wheels videos. as they're powered here you can add youtube videos on them you can add different parts of the screen on there anything you want can be run it's not just powered which has never been done before i would argue it's not been done before because it's just not useful it's it's cool to have that right it's nice to see them illuminated down there when you're showing the rig off the pitch and stuff but would you have that when you're driving i don't know 
So real quick with this. So how this even came to be is we built out this new studio. We got this TV wall and all this kind of cool stuff. And we wanted to hang wheels up. So when we did content, you guys could see the wheels in the background. And so I reached out to GSI and was talking to Jose and uh, Danielle. And then I was talking to Assetech as well about, hey, can we get these quick releases made <clears throat> that can power the wheels so when they're up on the wall, they can be illuminated. And so Astatech went and made us 12 of these like custom uh, quick releases that fit like the Astatech uh, wheelbases and stuff, right? And or, uh, the wheels and such. And then we had it for that. And then Chandler's like, hey, we're going to put this on Joe's rig. This would be kind of cool. We can do it to mount his wheels and stuff, right? Again, the, the, here's why, and people will say, oh, because as a celebrity, you guys did extra stuff. We do extra stuff for people all the time. We are constantly upgrading people to stuff because we want, as new things come out or pricing gets better or whatever, that's right. we're constantly including and surprising customers because that's what we wanted to do. That's what we'd want for us. Now, and with this, we're like, look, we're going to put this on. It's a product that's not even out in the market. But then so many people reached out and they said, that is awesome. So Astatech was here visiting with us from Denmark a couple weeks ago. And we mentioned this to them. And I said, look, I need, we need to have this made for us. Um, and now it's in production right now where they're actually going to be making this product. So for people that have their wheels, you can have it sitting on and it can be illuminated if you want it to be, right? And you can have it running. Do you need it? No. Is it cool? Of course. Like Jimmy says here, right? I mean, that's part of the cool thing about this is that you get these rigs, you have these wheels. The whole reason why people get the wheels with the LEDs and stuff is because it looks cool. Yeah, right. right? Like, and you want to okay. show it off. So <clears> if <throat> you spend, say, $7,000 on wheels, right? Let's yeah. just say if you do. Yeah. That, one could argue that you need to. No, you don't at all. But at all. if you have the wheels, right? Say you say you save it up to get one $2,000 wheel. Wouldn't you want to show it off even when you're not using it? Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, that's kind of the thought. So yeah. people reached out and said, we want this. And so now we're working with Assetech to produce these quick releases to where you can store your wheels and have like wheel mounts on yeah. your rig to do this. And they're not going to be crazy expensive either. No. But it is cool. I like the idea <laughs> of it. I just, it's one of those things where it's cool, but it just serves no, no purpose. That's it. So, right, here's my biggest pet peeve of this rig <clears throat> is that it's on this motion platform which is cool motion platforms i think are they're up and down some do some people do motion platforms well a lot of people do them badly it's very tempting to crank up the motion so you can Horrible. show off how look how crazy my thing's moving around but it's to the point where it's unrealistic and it actually hinders Correct. your driving i'm actually quite I'm not going to dive into brands and other things but this is absolutely one of the biggest things that all the pro drivers tell to us when they try some of the other ones and then they come and try ours, is that they're so over-exaggerated from some of the others, right? Like, like I mentioned, we're not you, Jimmy. We don't race, but we track, go ahead. We've tracked so many different cars. Um, and the goal here is to make it feel as real as possible as far as the travel and such, right? So in the McLaren, in our Lamborghini, in the R8, in our Radical, whatever, you're not traveling six inches, 12 inches, all this crazy crap that's going on. When you stomp the brake, your windshield is not looking at the ground, which we'll get into here in a minute. <clears throat> But you want these subtle cues that give you that feeling of, okay, I'm breaking, I'm dipping into the corner, just like you are in real life. It sets off that little timer in your head that says, okay, I should be braking for two tenths of a second or whatever it is. And then you let off the brake and you'll feel the car relax and where it gets back on all four wheels so you can make that turn better. That's how we have this set up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we do this to where it's, it's, we don't send it out of the box, just the, defect, uh, the default way that they have it. We kind of make our little fine tunes to it, to where it feels really accurate to us. I'm quite curious as to why they didn't opt to have any sort of harness. People laugh at the idea of having a harness in a fake sim, sim seat, but when you have motion, you need to go that extra level and have that harness there too, to actually keep you in your seat, keep you there planted. So here's what's cool about that comment, it's two things. One. This is how we even found out that you made a video for us. Today, all of a sudden, we got all these people saying, oh, you don't even have a harness. You don't even have a harness. You don't even have a harness. I'm like, where is this coming from? Because no one talks to us about having a harness. It's very, very rare, right? Now, we offer harnesses. We're working on actually tensioners and stuff, right? But the thing to understand here with this particular rig and with a lot of the rigs that are out there, this is going in Joe Rogan's studio. Um, the day that we actually installed this, which goes into the $70,000 type of thing, right? Is that not only are we shipping this out, it's in 260 crate, uh, 260 by 60 inch crate. So if you guys look at Uline, 
you look at their 60 by 60 by 60 inch crate, it's $550, right? So you need two of those. We need two of those for this particular rig. So that's, you know, we actually get it for a little less and we don't charge, we don't make any money on it. So we get them for 500 bucks, we charge that. So in this case, it's a thousand dollars for the crates and then freight. And there's been some people on here that talk about freight, that no freight, you guys understand from Nashville to uh, Texas, it's thousands. I mean, it's a lot of money to ship something because this also is not a 48 by 40 standard pallet. This is an oversized pallet, which is a 60 by and 60 there's two by of 60, them. and there's two of them. And total weight is, you know, 1,000 <clears throat> pounds, roughly. A lot pounds higher, so, yeah. right? Um, but as far as the harness goes, again, I lost where I was going with that or why I brought that up, but with the harness, right? Oh, no, we mentioned this. We're installing the rig at Joe's place, but realize that this is at Joe's studio. So, like, the day that we installed this, Joe was there, young Jamie was there, Chris Hemsworth was there. The next day, Cat Williams was there. You guys have seen the Cat Williams video, or at least some of you have, where he's on the rig doing things. So this is made for people of various sizes that are constantly going to be getting in and getting out of this. I don't know if you guys have ever really jumped into a, a thing with a five-point harness, but then you got to unloosen it, you got to loosen it back and put it back on. They're in this thing for just a couple minutes uh, so experience. Not this. only that, <clears throat> most people think of a motion rig as you know, an eight inch actuator and you're getting like the ones that go viral on yeah. Instagram where the guy's like six feet in the air going all, you know, trying to yeah, replicate he's pointing straight down when he breaks and stuff. The great thing about the D-Box uh, fifth gen actuator system, it's it's inch and a half to travel and it's not trying to replicate G-Force. It's trying to replicate haptic cues, meaning that... Why well, you stepped away, I went over this. Okay, well, okay, so okay. sorry, way to get pizza. We have pizza delivered yeah. down here. So... We're out that of town right said, now. We're in California and selling uh, additional rigs for other people right now. So we travel and do all this kind of stuff. So, so but I was going to say, it's like you really don't, I, I would say you just don't need a harness in a system like this. No, you don't. But again, if you want it, like at one of my rigs at my house, I have a harness on it. That's right. Right. And if you want it, but the reality is most of the time that harness is just leaning over the side of the chair. Yeah. Right. And for cases where people are jumping in and jumping out, not everyone is going to be strapping in a harness. They're just going to get in and experience the sim for a little bit and then get out. So you have two options. You either use a harness or they don't. So it's hanging off the edge, flapping around, or they sit on it. They put it all behind them and it becomes uncomfortable, right? So you want a harness. You want this to feel like your track car that has a five-point harness, six-point harness, whatever it is. Great. You can absolutely have that. Well, you have the cutouts for it right, right. there. <laughs> and for the sake of this, it, it's just, it's not a normal thing. People do not ask for it. And like you mentioned, Jimmy, like you don't want it to where it's throwing you around, right? It's not made to do that. It's too much when people turn the aggressiveness up on these things. And there's, we agree with you on that. So yes, in track cars, you obviously need to have this. You've got all the G's. You're not getting G's from this. There's not inertia from this. As you know from a sim racer who doesn't, uh, you don't have motion on your rig, but you understand you're getting the cues, right? And that's all motion is doing is adding additional cues to it where Chandler was kind of going with this. The biggest pet peeve is that this rig moves independently of the monitor. Can you imagine if you're driving a car around a circuit and you're in there like, and everything in front of you is just completely, completely static if, if you're going to say things like it can be used for training and it's super realistic and it's attention to detail it just feels very strange to admit that Bob. so real quick and we're almost done with all this video i know we're at 45 minutes long here but if you look like one dbox says don't do it don't have it attached one and two these 55 inch triple monitors what people don't realize i think is that they have speakers in every corner plus a subwoofer built into each screen that aren't being used because we have the 5.1 surround sound and all the other kind of stuff that's on there. Um, and you can't sync up all three monitors to work, but they, they're super, super heavy, right? So it's not really made for that. Three, kind of what I was alluding to a little earlier, and Jimmy, again, you know this, sorry, I keep calling you out on these different things. Not calling you out, but I, I, I want your two cents on it. But when we're in radicals or we're doing these things, when you hit the brakes, the horizon's staying there, right? And so you lock the horizon on these, which may or not have been done yet at this time of this video, but you'll lock the horizon the your dash is not looking down at the ground it's our head that's looking down at the ground or that is that's pivoting right. down right because the inertia that's happening <clears throat> the horizon and everything is still staying the same our windshield when we're in uh, uh enclosed cars is not facing down to the ground the windshield is moving a little bit but for the most part it's staying fixed where it's the inertia that's moving us all around right right you're right? driving you hit the brake <clears throat> you the move whole forward. car doesn't drop you drop. Of course, the front suspension will compress, yeah, the, but like, but it's to not, your point, it's, the, the horizon is locked. Yeah. And your windshield's pretty locked, too. It's just your head is the one that's going forward. Right. And now with all these, like even with the new Le Mans uh, game that came out, they actually have a button in there now 
uh, that says lock to horizon, right? Yep. So with iRacing, you have to do it a little differently. There's not a lock to horizon button. There's other things that you can do um, in other sims, right, to do that. But realize that again, uh, not everything needs to be that way. And you're going to see plenty of motion rigs that are out there, whether it's from ASR, from us, from Vasaro, whoever, that it's not attached to the sim rig itself, right? We've all seen all these different rigs. Now, you're seeing rigs more, like you mentioned earlier, where people are like six feet in the air and they're doing all this stuff. We are also working with Cubic. We have um, six DOF motion uh, actuator systems coming with screens attached to it. They can only go up to 32 inches, again, because of the weight and everything that goes on with it. We might be able to fabricate something ourselves to make it a little bigger. I don't suspect we're gonna be able to put arcs on there. And we'll also test it out and see how yeah. much better that might be, right? But for the most part, it's, rec it's recommended that you don't do it, which is why we don't. And then two, think about the space requirements and stuff for people that are also needed when doing that. All of a sudden you've got all this crap moving around this is going in people's well, well, the last thing too, and you, you might have said this when I was grabbing the pizza, but D-Box, at least to my knowledge, is the only FIA certified motion platform as a driver training tool. Yeah. And D-Box themselves does not recommend it, and it's for the reasons that we said. So it's not purely out of convenience. Yeah. And again, we want to try it, right? Yeah, so we've right. Had, we have other uh, motion systems coming, but um, the way that it's always been recommended to us is this way, and for a lot of different reasons. We've got our HOTAS controls. It's now, this is actually a bit that I'm going to skip because I actually don't know anything about flight sims at all. I'm a 100% a racing guy. Same. It does look sweet. I don't do a lot with flight with or Chandler. It looks pretty That's damn fun. cool. <laughs> that looks wicked. It does look awesome. Though. Okay, well, that looks like it's about it. And I, I guess the question I want to ask first is, do I think this rig is worth $70,000? No is the short answer, but I can see that there's been a lot of work that's put into making it look nice and making this quite high-end gear super accessible to someone maybe so again i just want to address it because i kept saying we would but again so not only is it buying all the different products and people will look at it and they go oh this is only thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment not realizing everything that's involved with it because there's actually a lot more to see equipment again like i mentioned earlier we're buying it at discounted pricing selling it at msrp blah 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 right we do charge for um, putting the rig together. There's obviously time, energy, and effort that goes into that. We have employees, we have overhead with our warehousing and, and all that other kind of stuff that goes on with it. But again, we're not charging $15,000. We're not even charging $10,000. We're not charging $8,000 to, to build this rig. The other thing that people aren't noticing though that we mentioned is like the crating, the freight shipping that goes on, the time for the team to fly out. There wasn't one person, there wasn't two people, there's multiple people that flew out there to transport the rig once it was at the location, to get it into the studio, to build everything out, to train everybody, and then we stay in touch with them. Also, something else to mention is it includes literally every single car and track that's in iRacing as of today, right? Every car, every track, every anything. So if the customer wants to jump into a, a rally, but wants to get into an F3 car, wants to get in GT3, GT4, F1, all that's there with all the different tracks. There's there's like three tracks that for licensing purposes can't come with it. The customer has to buy those um, individually, like the Norse Life and um, Spa and something else, right? But for the most part, everything comes with this ready to go. And for those that do iRacing, you guys know how expensive it is. You know the value in that. You know what it is, right? Yeah. So um, there's a lot that goes into that. And there's all these little, again, things like that, that like we mentioned, our surge protectors, the, uh, all the different bits that we use to, to mount everything, the USB hubs, the, um, uh, the server rack mounts, all the different kind of stuff that goes into this. There's so much that goes into it uh, that people just don't see and don't understand that is required for a finished good, kind of like what I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> if we just took, and again, Jimmy, not knocking your rig, we all have it and started that way as well. But if I sent a rig that didn't have an end cap like that, customers would be pissed, right? And so it's about the little details and making it look as much as a finished product as possible. So when the customer gets it, they feel proud about what they have. And then real quick, I'll finish. And then yeah. one other thing that we do after that is we have a whole team that gets on with customers that walks them through the setup of the system. Then we have other members that walks them through getting into iRacing or getting into ACC, taking them out on track, showing them the black box and showing all the different things. We have videos that we provide, but also just so much live stuff that we do. We have team viewer on every system. So we log in remotely and walk customers through it. We do customer track nights and all this different type of stuff that goes into this that's well beyond I'm buying a $15,000 uh, sim rig worth of all the hardware and I'm gonna build it all myself. Yeah, the, the <clears> point <throat> that I was gonna make 
because there's a lot of valid points and logic that I feel like you use in this vi video, Jimmy, but a lot of the, uh, I guess, the arguments or positioning is like, well, why would anyone need that? And I guess the question could be, no one really does. No. But it's the same way that you have 5,000 Porsche GT cars sold a year. The reality is that 95% of people buying a GT3 S or GT3 will never drive the car to that capability, right? I can never drive a GT3 S like Patrick Long can. And that's just the reality. However, it doesn't take away from the emotion I might have for something that's aesthetically pleasing, that is capable. And I feel like it's the same in sim racing because it, it's still the car world, right? So can I have arguably as much fun on a $15,000 rig of than course. a $50,000? Of course, right? <coughs> but is my immersion experience could be tenfold on a $50,000 rig? Sure, maybe not tenfold, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, it's just, and also too, you know, imagine having $3 million garage or even a $500,000 garage a lot of these people just want it as like a showpiece. It's part, of their, just it's capable, part of their man right? cave. I mean, we have so right. many customers that send us their garage where it's going, surrounded by all these exotic cars. They want these types of things. They and, want the. And that's not everybody. Wheels. No, it's not everybody. But it is everybody for the most part that that's wants buying these types of rigs. These types of rigs. Again, right. like we said earlier, we're selling plenty of rigs that are nine thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, thirteen thousand dollars, or whatever, right? And I think there's a little more that Jimmy talks about that we'll get into it that kind of goes with that. How to use it. There are a couple of oversights, like things I mentioned, like we talked no about the harness on the motion and why that's rig. not the there. Public location, independently stuff. of that motion rig, that kind of looks a little bit strange. Love for you to come out and try it. Like we can yeah. we get you in a ring and we'll get in multiple rigs and rip. High end client, but it does seem something that I've seen sort of creep into the sim race and market, where it's just this weird kind of almost luxury sim brands where they'll make you a rig, but they'll charge you out the. So I've got something to say. Yeah. Please. So, again, uh, and I want to say this in the right way because I don't want it to be isolating because we sell rigs to people all shapes and sizes and walks of life. But specifically talking about what you're speaking about, Jimmy, which is call it the whole ultra uh, high end and it's, it's the same value as a race car. For these types of rigs, traditionally we're selling to people that would not normally get into sim racing because with all due respect they don't want a sim like the one that jimmy's sitting in that doesn't mean it's bad right but they're a 50 year old you know three-time business you know yeah. acquisitions etc they've got two million dollars and four gts in the garage that's right and they they want something that attracts them because of their experiences which isn't traditional sim racing which that's is right. i think where jimmy comes, and that's okay no that's that's because, right because again a lot, yeah. lot of our customers are traditional sim racers right they're like you're mentioning they're guys that are tracking that have never even played video games they don't do any of this right yeah and that, that's why we help with all the customer support and all the training and stuff after the fact last thing i'll say just <clears throat> just wait a moment most of our customers like this will say i didn't want a sim rig but my driving coach is forcing me to get one and since i'm getting one i want the craziest thing that i can get yeah right yeah no for sure yeah. um I just lost my train of thought of something I'm else. Sorry. No, it's okay that I was going to say that was kind of important. But again, it's it's we're all saying the same thing, right? You yep. don't need these giant rigs and this crazy stuff. We are not, or at least nor do we start to start this to be the luxury sim brand. Like we mentioned early on, we were selling very much cheaper sims, but people were asking us to constantly keep trying to push the envelope or getting things bigger and better and stuff. Right now, I mean, there was someone else on one of the YouTube videos that was commenting like 32 screens is enough. I have 34 inch screens on my house, triples, yep. that's it, right? However, when you look at the 45 curves from uh, Ultra Gears, the LG Ultra Gears, or you look at the 48 inch Ultra Gears, or you look at these 55s, they're incredible. And Jimmy, you, you're like, these things look amazing. When people come in and they sit down on all these different size rigs, the 32 inch screens almost disappear to them. They see these 55s, they go, this shit is amazing. They get into it and it's like, you are in a car one-to-one. -one. Like everything is set up. Some of the videos where the camera's behind, your perception is off. Yeah, when you're especially if it's a wide seat, angle. Yeah, right? I mean, it looks like the mirrors are giant or whatever, but when you're sitting in the seat, everything goes the way it would be like in real life. And it's so immersive, it's really incredible. Well, I'll <clears> say <throat> on that last point, so we just had a customer flying from Vegas, Jason. Uh, we built a, one of our P1 RS rigs, which is like a Porsche rig. He's, he's got a Porsche GT3. And he got the 48-inch LGs. He tried our system with the 55s. Um, and he said something that I feel like you and I have said since we've tried them, which is at the bigger screens, so the 55s, especially the curved, you can feel the car rotate. Meaning, and if you track, you know what I mean. When you hit an apex and you're on the level of grip where you're on the edge, you feel the car physically rotating through the apex rather than you just turning in the cars, you know, 
over under steering. The car is actually physically rotating as you're turning. You can feel that with the screens because of your peripheral. You How can big actually everything see it. is. You can see you can everything that's kind of going on. So you can think, like Jason was saying, customers, completely objective. This means nothing to you guys, but he at least backed up what we already know, which is you can feel almost traction loss at that point because of the visuals. You can see everything rotating left and right, whereas in the 32s, you still can feel that but not to the degree that you can with those 55s. Master it, when in reality, you can build something that's a lot better, a lot more realistic, and probably a lot more fun. So I, I don't quite understand that part, right? And I understand he's just closing out his right. video here, yeah. but it's like a lot better. I mean, it's not like we're using cheap products and we're selling for a premium. We're selling some of the best products that are out there. So can you get better, a lot better? I, I don't know how, right? I mean, we use SimiQ, we use Assetek, all the different things that people want. So, you know, there's that. Um, a lot funner, maybe. I mean, if you want to build it and stuff yourself. Like, I don't know how it's a lot more realistic as well. We're using all the stuff that's available to us today. All of us, this industry. Those monitors, those monitors, monitors are, are amazing. ridiculous. I can't imagine how immersive that would be video, sitting sorry, there yeah. of these monitors wrapping around you. But you know what? I think this rig would actually benefit from more than Here those big monitors. And you'd probably save a whole heap of money from it you as would. well. It's just using a VR headset. All right, so <clears throat> been wanting to do a video for this. I'll try to make it quick. We'll probably still do a video on it. I've had Oculus since it was a Kickstarter project. Oculus Rift, Oculus Rift S. I've had every single one, Quest, Quest 2, Quest 3, Quest Pros. I absolutely hated VR forever. One, it makes me super sick. I've had, we've had countless people get into it that are super, that get super sick and motion sickness and such off of it. The new Quest, MetaQuest 3, to me has been a complete game changer. Because of the pass-through, you can just tap and see things a certain way. It is a little easier. Um, the clarity still is not nearly as good. Everybody mm -hmm. says this, right? When you first get in, it looks cool. You're immersed. You're looking around. But the clarity is not nearly as good. Now, once you're driving, that starts to go away. You're not really paying attention to all the little details. You're in the mode. You're, you're, you're locked in, right? Um, racing. But the clarity is definitely not there. The other thing is, it's just not every day you're picking up the headset, putting on, and it works. Every single time, and we're on that thing, we're on, I mean, we're distributors for Pimax. We have Pimax Crystals. We work with Meta. We have MetaQuest 3s. We work with Best Buy as well, who are getting us things at, at different price points for different things, blah, 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 right? We, we work with a lot of different VR. <clears throat> but every time you get it, it's not just, oh, here, now it's working. And realize what Chandler had mentioned earlier, like a lot of our customers that are buying this level of rig are not your normal gamers who are going to be able to put up with, I'm going to put on a VR, everything's black, or I'm looking at a virtual place. What do I, how do I grab things? Where do I get my keyboard? We're going to, we would get so many calls all the time for it. I would consider you and I experts, and there's plenty of times where, where we like, want to throw it off our face after that's 10 all minutes the time, of right? there's rebooting and trying to get it to connect. That being said, we sell VR systems where they don't have the screens. Most of our customers don't want to mess with it. Um, we will have more uh, out on, the, um, on our website here soon. They're all sub 10 grand. Where you, no, they don't have motion, right, at that price point. But you'll have uh, VR rigs that get delivered to your house, built, configured, ready to go, and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to start seeing us sell a lot more headsets on our website for those that want it. <clears throat> but VR is not end-all or be-all. It is going that direction. I absolutely believe uh, in the next handful of years, VR will be amazing. Um, but it's it's for a lot of people, it's still not what it needs to be. No I monitor setup can beat the 3D effect that VR has, in my opinion. What do you guys think? The, I mean, the Apex, the able to see it and look out and do stuff with VR Let me is know incredible. Down below in the comments. Take care, have an awesome day. Thanks, Jimmy. See you next time. <laughs> Jimmy, here, stop it, I guess, real quick. Jimmy, appreciate it. Appreciate everything. Appreciate the time that you took to even make this video. We've made it three times longer or four times longer. I'm sorry about that. But um, would love to talk to you sometime. Like I mentioned, you've been part of our journey from for for a long time so i appreciate everything that you've done jimmy one other quick thing sorry we cut but we're coming back i want to just tell you like we'll do one of two things for you if you'd like i'd like the first option which is we'll fly you out to podium one you can come hang out with us maybe we can schedule something on the track and kind of can do some cool stuff but you get to check out the different rigs you get to see those arcs in action or two we can send you an arc so you just let us know um again i'd prefer it to be one we'd love to have you um and then we can discuss things a little bit more. Then you actually get to see some of this stuff in action as well, as far as the motion, not being with the monitors and such. And then by that time, we'll have all these different motion platforms in there as well. So essentially where I'm at with it. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Everyone else, any questions, let us know. Hate us or love us. That, that is what it is. It's a part of the business. But uh, we're here to help. That's why we started this. 
Um, it's why we spend a lot of time and energy building and shipping and stuff from all over the world to be able to provide it here in the United States for everybody that wants it. I mean, we obviously ship out all over the place, but the main focus was to build a really cool sim racing facility and uh, program here for everyone in the United States. Have a good one. We'll see you guys again.